Manette Da Silva is a Sri Lankan architect born in 1918 in Kandy, the second largest town of Sri Lanka. Mostly known for being close friends with Le Corbusier, Da Silva was an innovative and creative designer whose achievements have been historically overlooked. She was not only the first Asian woman to qualify as an associate of the Royal Institute of British Architects, but was also one of two women in the world to establish an architectural practice in her own name at the time. She pioneered the concept of critical regionalism, which she called modern regionalism, a method of combining modernism with aspects of traditional Sri Lankan architecture and craft. Through both her theoretical and built work, she was an early proponent of climate responsive and eco design. She is underappreciated and her work has become largely unacknowledged, despite the innovative concepts she developed throughout her career. De Silva studied architecture as an apprentice in Bombay where she, along with her sister Anil and writer Mulk Rajanand, founded Marge, a seminal roused South Asian arts magazine, which is still in existence today. Through this magazine also came the start of her friendship with Le Corbusier. At the start of her career, she worked on numerous small villas for family friends, including her first project, the Karunaratni House in Kandy, which is the first home ever designed by a woman in Sri Lanka, and displays the earliest manifestation of her building philosophy, in which she integrates modernist ideas into an Asian context in harmony with the landscape. She used modern construction techniques in the forms of concrete columns, trusted rafters, and glass blocks, but also utilized rough and ready local materials like rubble, brick, timber, lacquer work, terracotta tiles, and other local handicrafts. The house itself looks somewhat ordinary, resembling the American bungalow. However, it clings to the hill with the floors following the slope of the terrain and displays a clear understanding of the logistical and climatic elements of the region. The north side of the home, while exposed to the sun, is shaded under covered balconies, deep verandas, and skirted with gardens. Spacious and interconnected interiors allow for a flow of light and air throughout. The bedrooms and entrance are located on the first floor, while the main living spaces are on the lower floor to open into the garden, creating a strong indoor-outdoor connection in harmony with the tropical way of life on the island. This interior layout also serves as a preview of one of her later developed concepts, the Meta Medulla, integrating the garden into the living space itself. De Silva herself was from a wealthy family and a part of the global elite. While designing, she looked to transcend past the frivolity of the rich and, in, and turn to the work of local artisans, reviving a waning traditional arts and crafts industry and ensuring that often impoverished craftspeople could earn a living from their work. Local artisans were hired to weave Nambara mats, which were used as paneling for internal doors, fire clay tiles along ancient patterns, and commissioned the local artist George Keat to paint a mural which was set into the length of the living room wall. Modernizing traditional aspects of Sri Lankan architecture, De Silva also experimented with indigenous methods such as wattle and daub and rammed earth technology, which is a process commonly encouraged today in the construction of eco-homes. Built in 1954 for the Fernando family, the Fernando townhouse was a product of her research into low-cost housing and indigenous building methods. The home was designed as a compact cube, utilizing rammed earth building techniques and making the building suitable for the hot and humid climate. Cooling crosswinds are channeled between the two floors of the home through the central satin wood staircase and surrounding verandas. There are also air shafts between the door lintels and ceiling for more ventilation. De Silva focused on maintaining a relatively low cost, constantly working with her client to cut down expenses. Through the 1950s, De Silva worked on a groundbreaking housing development scheme for public servants in Condi. This is known to have been her most ambitious and challenging commission, where she implemented a participatory approach that was decades ahead of its time. In this exercise in building strong mixed communities, she consulted extensively with future householders to find out how they wanted to live and conducted detailed surveys on their living patterns. She used this information to design different housing types, some of which were built by the householders themselves. She also designed with the social aspect of the scheme in mind, prioritizing desi designing to encourage built relations between householders of varying racial, religious, and economic backgrounds. Though she did not receive hardly any acknowledgement for the project, she knew the ultimate success of the scheme would be measured by how useful householders found the new living environment. Over the course of its existence, the design proved to be successful and became a model for other housing schemes in Sri Lanka. As South Asian countries gained independence following the partition in 1947 and a period of nation building across the subcontinent commenced, modern architecture became an important agent in asserting participation in progressive global politics. Though De Silva's career has been largely unacknowledged due to her being a woman, the innovative approaches and concepts she developed had lasting influence on South Asian architecture. With influence from seminal Western architects such as Le Corbusier, De Silva explored fusing European modernism with a regional style of architecture, propelling Sri Lanka's architectural development within a global context. She designed to reflect this synthesis through a mix of materials, including both modern and traditional construction practices and the inclusion of local craft techniques, such as Kandian woodwork, woven hemp to bara mats, traditional ornamental motifs and murals. De Silva's work was also an early proponent of climatically and socially responsive design, utilizing alternative materials and establishing a practice of eco-architecture. She pioneered practices of vertical development, space optimization, 
compressing environments in increasingly populated cities, and finding economic solutions without compromising the principles of a building's identity. Her progressive approaches to construction techniques were especially radical because she applied them to both rich and poor. In integrating modern ideas into a local context, De Silva's work supported decolonization and post-independent Sri Lanka and paved the way for the development of Sri Lankan architecture and innovation.